welcome. Thank you for coming tonight. Uh, I appreciate your interest in my epic poem and contributing to the uh, uh, Birmingham Unitarian Church auction. And I think it's a really fine, fine fundraiser and way to do it. Um, I'm going to briefly outline the epic poem. We're going to jump into it. Few words on epic poetry in general. It tells a story, a narrative, and it's a vision of life. Homer in ancient Greece, he's dealing with the whole ethos of a civilization, writing both on war, one epic on war, and one on domestic life and uh, cultural values, really, in the Odyssey. Roman epic Virgil is writing uh, in his book, The Aeneid, about uh, domestic life, or rather, uh, uh, is writing about basically the similar cultural values of the Roman Empire, moving towards Emperor Augustus, and a vision of the future of Rome, Rome's imperial, rising imperial uh, period. With Dante in the early Middle Ages, it's European Christianity, and uh, he, he's, uh, in terms of basic outline, traveling, journeying, Dante journeys to hell, to purgatory, and to paradise. For uh, John Milton, the English epic poet, he's writing about uh, Protestant Christianity, of course, uh, but uh, attempting to justify the ways of God to man, as he puts it. And uh, Adam and Eve, the whole story, biblical and um, a Christian myth, is there. In the Parliament of Poets, my epic, I'm attempting to evoke a global, universal vision of life for our time. Everything in our life is global, has become global, is, is heading that way, it seems, uh, increasingly on all fronts. And I'm trying to respond to that human experience. Larry highlighted how Apollo, the Greek god of poetry, calls all the poets to the moon to assemble and to uh, debate the meaning of uh, modernity, uh, modern life. And uh, the Parliament of Poets then selects one poet, sends him on a journey to all the continents to learn from the different spiritual and wisdom traditions of humanity. On the earth and on the moon, <laughs> they teach him a new universal global vision of life. Um, now, uh, I'm going to read from book one, which is set on the moon in the middle of things, in the middle of the action. I'm going to read the very beginning of book two, which is uh, dealing with Black Elk and Chief Seattle, if you've ever heard of them or read them, American Indians, uh, set on the moon, also set on the moon. Uh, I'm going to read then from the end of book two, dealing with the uh, Australian Aborigine named Japara. Japara means moon man uh, in Aborigine language, whatever it was. And uh, then close uh, in under an hour, uh, <laughs> and, uh, 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 dealing with Dunhuang in China. Dunhuang, China has the Mogao Caves, and the Mogao Caves, Buddhist Mogao Caves, are really uh, among the most famous Buddhist caves and relics and uh, artifacts uh, left to civilization, really, from the great height of Buddhism. Jumping into book two, rather, uh, spoke book one, very beginning of book one, the persona speaking. In the mid part of the moon I stood, in the midst of the sea of tranquility, looking around me from rim to curving rim, the brilliant moonscape against the blackest, blackest space, stark blackness, polarities of light and night, where a human footstep marked a giant leap forward in lunar dust for all mankind. Footsteps still all about, undisturbed, 
untouched by decades of time, destined to remain for all time, eternity, or as near to it as we can imagine. Unlike what Robinson Crusoe found, <coughs> an ephemeral footprint on a beach. Here with instruments and a flag unfurled in the solar wind, half a lunar module, the descent platform left far behind, the glory of the moon in all creation. And then I saw him sitting upon his nag, Rosinante, Don Quixote, a lance resting across his saddle as he leaned forward from next to a crater, gazing my way. First, shock overwhelmed me, finding myself where I was, disoriented, disbelieving. How could it be? I stood there without an encumbering spacesuit, lightly clad in my old corduroy jacket, worn beyond its prime, breathing in the atmosphere of the moon. The man of La Mancha plodded slowly on his nag, <coughs> even as I began to realize we were not alone. A crowd of people were coming toward me, too. How could they have gotten here as well, I wondered. My own presence and Cervantes still a mystery, unexplained, <coughs> beyond belief, amazement, deeply stirring, shaking my very being as I recall my flight to the moon. A creaking leather saddle woke me further to his nearness. As he leaned closer to me, looking annoyed, eyeing me from his mount. So he finally made it up here. What's taking you so long? We've all been waiting for you. Here they come. Snap out of it and collect your wits. At the head of a throng of people, massing across the sea of tranquility, I began to discern, to discern other old friends, long known but never met face to face, only in ink, the printer's art, or used to be. In the front of the crowd, drawing near, I saw Dufu wrapped in Confucian reserve and robe. Exiled, forced to wander and beg, seeking food, crumbs at the door of the great, hoping for an appointment from the emperor, dreaming of a great man who would bring down the river of heaven to wash away the blood of weapons never to be used again. Flowing behind him, his robes stirred up the moon dust like a mist about his feet, standing still a distance away, saying with elevated dignity, you who have been the Chang'an, welcome to the moon. Next to him stood Li Po, friend and fellow poet. Bai Jui followed both, a voice for the people, daring to speak of injustice to the emperor, his fame reaching all the way to distant lands far to the east, Korea in Japan, a lay Buddhist of the fragrant mountain. The scent of the same fragrance came from the Japanese poets next to him, Fasho, like a monk, but the dust of the world upon him, Saigyo, a monk who left his military clan, Zayami, playwright of the court, whose plays lay bare his time, cutting through to another realm like a samurai sword. Milarepa, the Tibetan poet, clad in cotton, wrapped in selfless practice, detached but from Buddha's teaching of Dharma. Another fragrance, too, rose petals and poppies, attar and rumi, the journey of the hoopoo to the Samor, the beloved, delirious, whirling in a vortex of longing, and nagui mafus, wearing a cravat. They and many other poets flowed into the landing site. Samuel Johnson and Thomas Gray, Henry Vaughan and George Herbert, Dryden, Shakespeare and Marlowe, Ben beside them, jostling and pushing forward, Shelley and John Keats, William Wordsworth, Longfellow, 
Robert Burns looking ready still to raise a pint for old Lang Syne, his mountain daisy and rose. While Welsh bards stood on a rock with Taliesin, spreading out around space junk left behind, between and among the old instruments, the hardware of tranquility base. I could now see poets of the book, Job of tested patience, long suffering, Dante, the man who had been to hell, Milton, who justified the ways of God, song of the conquering evolution of the soul, the battle of good and evil, choosing through free will God's holy gift. Rumi's Indian brother, reincarnated Kabir, weaver of a Muslim Hindu cloth, warp and woof of the one, free of duality, Vyasa, Kalidasa, and Tagore, all had come from their ashrams to Eden. And standing nearby, Sinlike Unini, O wound God, accept my prayer, who entered into the spirit of he who saw the deep out of the libraries of Babylon, Sumer, raised the song of Gilgamesh and Enkidu, their journey through Mesopotamia. From every land and clime, all around they stood, poets of every continent jostling for a sight of the poet from Earth, ahead of his time, new arrival, not yet translated to the spirit of the universe. African poets and shamans, griots of ancient songs, singers of rituals, nobly held their instruments, flutes and calabashes, drums, ready to play as though Balafaseki were about to step forward to sing the tale of Sogolan's son, Sunyata, unifier of Mali and much of the Africa of his day. And from the Americas, too, were tellers of tales, Hopi and Navajo, Lakota, Odawa and Iroquois, Mohican, American tribes beyond telling, Incan and Aztec, Aborigines of Australia, drums and didgeridoos, island peoples. All stood quietly on the moon, watching, pressing to see this most curious of sights, a supposed white man from the suburbs, not long from morning prayers, plumped down on the moon. Together, Merlin and Queen Mab stood before the crowd, he holding out his staff, she clothed in nature's bountiful plenty, catching the eye of many poets and seers. Speaking the thought of many present, addressing Cervantes, Merlin asked, what is this embodied spirit doing here amongst us, disturbing the serenity of our lunar home? How can this be? Is this one of your quixotic jokes? Did you bring him here, and what's the point? Cervantes leaned slightly back in his saddle. Rosanante snorting, giving her head a little shake, her mangy mane taking a while to resettle in low gravity. All eyes moved from Merlin to Cervantes, who replied, once peace and quiet had resumed, though how and why the heavenly realm that poets have occupied from time immemorial could be compromised still seemed to hang upon the lips of many, glared from their eyes, full of curiosity. Cervantes, cocking back his head with authority, swept his eyes over the assembly of poets. The pressing multitude began. We have all experienced the loss of the living presence in modern times. Even those who would go backwards show loss. Our people all lose their way. Bewildered, science usurping the glory of the moon. Our domain, where most of us dwell even now. Just look around at all the trash the astronauts and scientists left behind, scattered about the beauty of this plane. All man's science and technology cannot understand the moon. 
mighty symbol of eons, visible sign uplifting men's eyes to the heavens. You all know I speak the truth. Many of our people, and even some of us, cling to nostalgia, but it is not the same as that deep experience of the divine. Lifting his lance into the air, waving it about, Rosanette leaping apace, raising her forelegs, Cervantes exclaimed, Obey, Lord Apollo, I challenge you. I call here a parliament of poets. Book two, at the very beginning, Black Elk and Chief Seattle. A great war cry went up, drums, tom, tom, the deep bass sound of tightly stretched hide, chanting of many braves, pounding of hearts, clearing a space, poets made ready for a young Lakota Indian brave, strong and virile, raising a hoop before him, dancing the hoop dance of his people, the hoop dance of all the peoples of Mother Earth, far above, while all stood round, the poets and seers, shamans and singers, griots and troubadours, bards and rhapsodes, watching him pounding moon dust, mesmerized, for he danced in another world, the world, as it were, of the moon. Behind him all could see the hoop of the earth, beyond the hoop of the hoop of the moon, the hoop of our rotating solar system, the hoop of the spiraling Milky Way, the hoop of the endless galaxies. His long braids spun with the planets, spinning on their axes as he weaved in and out through nine hoops, and the pounding of the drums pulsed through the arteries of the universe. First one way, then the other, his moccasins dancing through moon dust, feathers proudly worn, hide, loin cloth, pipe bone breastplate, and headdress transfixing everyone by the energy of his dance. Seen by all, an even more astounding sight took place as he slowly changed into an ancient medicine man, standing proud and noble, holding a sacred poop stick a medicine wheel with seven feathers suspended from it. The youth was gone. Black Elk stood before us. Behold the earth, he commanded, gesturing with his coop stick, directing our gaze, rising like a hoop of many peoples. It is holy being endless, broken like a wing of, ring of smoke, the broken hoop begins to heal, to encircle the Indian nations. All nations, once again, heal. All the universe seemed to listen. In a sacred manner, wide as starlight, though broken and scattered, Black Elk moved toward me, lifting his croup stick to earth. The holy tree will heal and flourish poets and shamans, bring the people back into the sacred hoop that they might walk again the red road in a sacred manner. Pleasing to Wanka Tonka, the great mystery, Gitchi Manitou, the great spirit, the great father beyond all the names of my people, the spirit of the universe. Looking out over the sea of tranquility, at the sea of faces, following his every word, Black Elk said, Though nations are in despair, teach this poet your strong medicine, that he might help humankind walk the good road again. Coming down from the module, I stood before Black Elk, struggling with emotion, speechless overcome by the vision of his words. Black Elk began chanting, raising the hoop, raising the vision of man, not white, not red, but human before the universe. 
the good earth spinning in the background. And then he said, it is hard to follow the great vision in the world of darkness. Many men get lost among the shadows. Turning round to all the assembled poets on all sides, Black Elk said, we must be the pathfinders for this poet. Guide him through the force of memory on the right path. Even I despaired for my people. I, to whom was given so great a vision, sometimes dreams are wiser than waking. We know the center is not dead, cannot die. The great mystery watches all his children. Help this poet tend the sacred tree, bloom again at the center of the hoop. If your medicine is strong, pour it forth. And then from the Indian hunting party, another chief stepped forward, Chief Seattle. In full regalia, a headdress of eagle feathers and brocade flowing down behind him. Standing next to Black Elk, Chief Seattle said, gazing at our planet, every part of Earth is sacred. To our sacred to our people. Pine needles and sandy shores, dark woods and meadows, the humming insect and the howling wolf, all are holy. The earth is our mother. What befalls her befalls the sons of earth. Earth does not belong to man. Man belongs to the earth. The great mystery has woven this web. Man is but a strand within it. Our God is the God of all people. The earth is precious to him. To harm the earth is to heap contempt upon him. We must preserve the land for all children. There is only one God, and we are brothers after all. Black Elk, you must teach this poet your strong medicine. Take him to the caves below. Before our people, time before time, before we cross the land and ice into the deep caves of the past. As into a sweat lodge he must go. Teach him the ways of earth people so that his tongue may chant the song that will help the world tree grow again. At last, the great circle of peace hoop the globe. With those words, the great chief passed back into the hunting party, his words in the moon air, leaving all pondering deeply what he had said. Black Elk broke the silence. The great chief has spoken. The path is laid before us. I and he who must tell the tale shall leave. The rest of you remain upon the moon. Consider what in your turn you must teach. Choose your lessons wisely. Guide him aright. Help him become a living dream catcher through which all that is bad will pass while hooping the will of the great spirit as far as a brave can serve him for the good of the tribes and many peoples. Ending, Black Elk turned to me, gesturing to grasp his wrist, saying, Come. Holding aloft his croup stick, with firm shakes on high, near the medicine wheel, I closed my hand around his wrist, feathers brushing across as I did. I felt a strength I had never known, a tingling sensation, feeling more alive than I had ever been. Swiftly we rose from the surface of the moon, leaving behind a parliament of poets as an Indian war cry sent us on our way. The end of book to Japara, Australian Aborigine.
While I struggled to come to terms with my thoughts in the woods, I saw a figure frightening to look at, given my new discovery. So, so different was he from all that I had known and been. A naked man out of an ancient time, primordial, older than the caves, of black and muddy complexion, holding a spear covered with white stripes and dots painted all over his body bristly, woolly hair, staring at me as I tried to recover from my shock of horror. Desperate to judge his intent. Headhunter? An ancient shaman from an ancient land? I mulled over Black Elk's words. Drawing near, he spoke as out of a dream. The poets on the moon have sent me to lead you on. Out of the dreaming, I am Japara. Moon man, my face scarred like the moon at night. And I have come to tell you the story of our bands on the land from every wind. Do not fear, I have come to take you there. Gently he walked toward me like a hunter toward a skittish deer, saying, hold my arm firmly and we shall go from here. Done by the appearance of the man. I scarce knew what to do, but could not stay there thinking of the bones, such horror, while well, this guy had seen mild, though primordial. I awoke from my fear, his demeanor winning me over despite my days and thoughts as I slowly moved towards him, grasped his wrist. Before I knew it, we were ascending that ancient forest and cave far below. I barely could look at him as we flew for fear that fear would cause me to let go. His dark and ancient visage so unknown. In a vortex, time swirled, carrying us along, I and my new companion, and then I noticed from that great height the ocean seemed to be lower, continents nearly covered in ice as we passed from the hemisphere his outstretched spear steering. Much land and sea swept by, while at times campfires below and ants here and there. After a long while over water, I saw ahead an enormous island, brown and reddish, even from that great height. I wanted to ask him where on such a vast continent we were going, when suddenly it became clear he was heading for its center dry and red, a desert, so it seemed. Other deserts came to mind that I had known. We go to where the dreaming can be told, he said, leaving me still wondering where that might be and what it was. Over land we flew a few rivers, some dry beds that snaked their way across both lush and withered land, lowering towards the ground, small groups of people here and there, a mere handful clinging to life, scattered across the vast expanse. Even further towards the center, in the distance, a looming mountain, an enormous red rock abruptly rising from the land, unlike anything around it. More at ease, I looked at Japara, asked him with my eyes, an annoying tourist, he explained, Uluru, but we go beyond into the dream. And soon it lay behind out of sight as we sped forward somewhere. We were nearly touching the treetops and brush, brush mostly if not scrub. Ahead, a band of people, women cooking over a fire, children ran about, some sat in a circle next to a lean-to tending to some handicraft or task. Suddenly we were seen and a stir went up with Japara waving his spear, shouting in a tongue I could not understand. Likely we sat down not far from them, the desert dust rising slightly around us as we found our footing on earth again. Gesturing towards me as he spoke, Chapara seemed to be introducing me to the clan. 
many of whom eyed me apprehensively as a stranger dropped from above. I now could understand Japara as he greeted them in his native tongue. This is the shaman I told you about from the moon, from every wind, where the people have forgotten the dreaming, the sacred we experience and live in. He must learn and tell the tale once again. A thrill went through me at his words. Hope rising that he might know better than I myself, so we can give him to despair. Addressing all the clan, he said, Tonight the golden ring forms around the moon and Kulama, ceremony of renewal, prepared. Japara led me away to a lean-to by a gum tree, where I fell into a deep sleep, dreams of oblivion, all that I had been through flowing through my mind. When I awoke, it seemed I had slept long and late into the day, for the sun was already near noon, and women and children were busying about, tending to one duty or another, preparing yams for the evening feast. The men were gone. In a time before time, I arose from the lean-to, which was shielding me from the sun, looking about, and saw Japara in a hunting group of men, giving the game to the women as they passed. Japara greeted me from a distance. We have had a good hunt while you dreamed. The women will prepare the food. Come with me and men where we can properly tell you the stories, several of them behind him. Still amazed at the sight of me as I had been. <laughs> we see different beings from different galaxies. Japar led me away from the camp and into the desert behind the lean-to, and away from most of the women with only a few following behind us. At a clear place of desert sand, free of brush, where a circle and fire pit had been dug, not far from caves in a lake, Japara made a sign and we all sat in the circle. A short silence fell upon us. No one moved. One of the women, Mimbarda, began to speak, sweeping the sand smooth and level with a stick drawing two men in the sand. I felt that something of great importance was about to be told. All were silent. In the beginning, Jindu, the creator, sent two wise men to shape the earth. From the far end of the Milky Way, which she drew in the sand above the men, they shaped the sea, the earth, and sky. And then Jindu sent seven sisters, stars of the Milky Way, the Pleiades, to beautify the earth with flowers and trees, birds and animals, every creeping thing, drawing the seven sisters near the men. Younger men and women now joined the outside of our circle. Mimbarda continued without any sense of interruption. While they worked, one of the younger sisters fell in love with the two wise men following them into the bush one day. Dharama, the great spirit, had warned them that if such a thing happened, they could not return to the Milky Way. So while the one woman had to stay, the others rose to the stars, and the two spirit men remained behind and became human. Like us, losing their special powers, feeling longing for their home. They became parents of the earth who made laws and ceremonies, the parents of people, the desert people, and all our bands, Tugi and Waro Piri, Nanda and Ola, Kokoara, Kiwi, Yonugu, Aruta, Bartanji, Buchula, Targari, Dangu, and Iwaman, Gari Inkura, Rembarunga Nakara, and Maduanga, Maya Kalali, Ponga Ponga, Alawa, Jandruwanta, and Aravana. 
bands of many names, man and woman. People spread throughout the bush, all directions, many tongues and kinship from our parents. The sun moved deeper into the afternoon. O oh, desert people, O oh, stranger from afar, 400 bands and more spread over the land. This is why we have knowledge and respect for the universe, drawing a mountain. The great spirit Jindu and Guru Dari, Guthi Guthi Dharama, the spirit of many names, Yuin Monaro. He came down from the sky and saw that there was no water that could be seen. So from Mount Manara, he called Weawi, the rainbow spirit serpent in the mountain. Guthi Guthi called, Weawi, Weawi! And the water serpent came out, traveled over the land, making water in holes, streams, billabongs, and lakes throughout the land. As Mimbarda continued to recite the dreaming into the night, more villagers joined us, widening the circle, and later the circle revolved like the stars above. Dancing, singing, and chanting, drums and didgeridoos, sonorously lifting the hearts of all, swirling circles, dots on the faces around me, circles in the sand, twirling time, dream time, everywhere, now. A young couple had disappeared together. The woman, the women began to remove the yams from the fire, unearthing them, people eating, here and there a circle of people, sharing sustenance of life. The glow of the fire lit the surrounding darkness, night sky. As people watched Chaparro with his spirit quietly motioned me aside and then into the desert bush where he said, it is time that we return to our home, the moon where you have more to learn and know. He held out his arm to me and with all fear long gone, I understood taking hold of my brother's wrist. Through the dreaming we soared, rising in the night, the glowing circle down below fading smaller, while the brilliant moon loomed larger as we flew heavenward. Moon man and moon man, homeward bound. I'd like to dedicate the reading of this uh, book six uh, in memory of Elaine Morse, whom I met uh, when I first attended informational meetings here at BUC and actually in this room back in October of 2011. Uh, she, she and I had a, a couple of good conversations about UU and Buddhism. She had some interest and in, uh, uh, just being in this room and reading this made me think of her now, uh, this book, book six, is set in the Mogao Caves on the Silk Road in China, far northwest. And the western, the west of China is out there in Dunhuang, in that area. There's a famous book from Neo-Confucian times, 16, 15, 1600s titled The Journey to the West. It's about a, a monk, uh, many hundreds of years previously, who traveled from the capital of China, out the Silk Road, through Dunhuang, down into India, had to go around the Himalayan mountains, and there he spent uh, uh, many, many years collecting Buddhist texts, brought them back to China for a, a full round circuit of seven, took him 17 years, and spent the next 20 years translating them. But he's the pivotal care person in the transmission of Buddhism from India to uh, 
China, and he moved, he passed through Dunhuang and the Mogao Caves. In the journey to the west, there's a character called Sun Wukong. Sun Wukong means monkey king. He's a four-foot little monkey, impish, humorous little character, runs throughout Chinese civilization and culture, is in uh, Chinese opera and even popular culture today. And he's a character here in my book, too. I followed him up and along the stairs in a walkway, sensing he knew the way, my monkey king guide. The heat of the sun now on us, I could feel the day coming on, hot and dry as an Arizona desert. With the sun, we entered the cave, Tang Dynasty. At its height, sumptuous detail everywhere, glorious art informating a world beyond art. Art its servant, glory in its servitude exalting in worship of beauty beyond beauty, the highest, deepest, true beauty, the good, the true, the beautiful, made one. All, waves of all overwhelmed me. I felt it once again. Wukong silently stepped aside, stayed back out of the way, allowed me to move forward past the murals toward the niche deeper into the western wall, where those before me reigned in splendor, glory, the Buddha Sakyamuni, his right hand raised in the mudra of have no fear, though I was already far beyond fear, where no fear can ever reach, taking in all the scene, his sitting on an octagonal throne, Mount Meru, as it were, the center of the universe, cosmic mountain transcending the worldly plane, far beyond the mountain caves. Encircled with the nimbus of spiritual fire, his glowing nature made manifest. He sat in lotus position, head erect and calm, peace and nobility emanating, resonant in his bearing, crowning essence, long ear lobes intimating the princely world he left behind, flowing robes. He seemed to float above the cave floor, above the world, while his companion stood on either side. To the left, flanked by Ananda, upon a lotus, in humility, service his garland and ceaseless sacrifice, tending to all, remembering all the Buddha's sermons. Thus I heard it said, Ananda passed down the Buddha's words to the generations. Flowing out around the world and through the worlds, his hands held together in front of him, ready to serve selflessness his station. To the right, flanked by Maha Kashyapa, an old monk, mendicant, a little gaunt. Peace to and surrender, service and protection his boon, perhaps smiling faintly. Buddha's flower sermon lingering in his mind, Chan and Zen enveloping his mind and life, successor and convener of the Sangha. Buddha entrusting him with the Dharma gate, no words or letters, the form of the formless, a transmission beyond remembered scriptures, experience, not creeds and letters. So Kashyapa stood and meditated next to Sakayamuni, right hand too raised in have no fear, Bodhidharma, the successor. The Lotus Sutra passing to all bands. Next, both sides, faces in meditative bliss, curving brows and jewels, lotus-flowered robes, Avalokiteshvara, Guanyin, Kanon, his, her guiding presence, merciful, compassionate, standing, heads leaning toward the Buddha, 
their Buddha nature emanating, drawn, sign toward its essence, curving delicacy of detail, much as showing the way to light, protection, compassion, flowing toward all creation, sustaining, enlightenment foregone, leading all toward it. Supreme sacrifice for humanity, that all humanity might find mercy, love, compassion from suffering on the road of life. Exquisite robes and sashes, coiffures, jewels, symbols of symbols, of experience calling all on to experience, raising, transforming, saving all from peril, purely guiding to a pure land, as if saying, praise, call, intone, Guan Yin, Avalokiteshvara, Amitabha, for deliverance, all may reach the pure land. Last, stand the guardians of Buddha, Vajrapani generals, image of the Buddha's power, protecting him from the demons of our nature, guided, girded in warrior armor, ready to defend, tread underfoot, ignores forms of the Buddha's form, Guan Yin, spreading his and her protection, care, once holding staffs and weapons, soon Wu Kong in different forms. The Tang pantheon complete, raised to the highest heaven, nirvana wrought at its best in paint and clay, artistic form of highest form in the heart of the cave, the Tang Cave to a map of the mind. I found myself upon my knees, gazing at the niche, the walls and statues, symbols of another world. Not this, though made of this, pointing on beyond to one higher, as on looking up the ceiling itself. Resplendent jewels bedecked a stupa, Buddhas of the Lotus Sutra, welling up out of the earth, the lotus out of the muck and mire, the mire of this world to which we cling, clings to us. Manjusri holding the sacred flame of wisdom, cutting through delusion. Mandalas, medicine wheels of the yeast. The ultimate beauty of the universe, Dun Wang, the great western paradise, the pure land of Amitabha Buddha, Buddha of infinite light, compassion, Guan Yin, the guide to the promised land, on the journey to the West. Nothing in the world is difficult, only the mind makes it so. The physics of the mind and consciousness. On that ceiling in those walls, the image of release, moksha, achieved in form, experienced by those who pass this way. Eternities went by while I kneel. Time before timelessness, behind the figures, upon the walls, bodhisattvas gazed out, and women, the beauty of the female, silks and elegant coiffures, graceful gowns, musicians playing the pipa, heavenly music accompanying the apsaras, flying, dancing upon the plain above. I knew not whether I looked or closed my eyes, meditative realm beyond this world, form moved into formlessness, and I followed with all my heart into my heart and the heart and soul of the universe. I wanted to kneel and sit on the floor to the right, but knew it was not my place 2,500 years having gone by. My karma leading me elsewhere to service in a different way. And so I had to resist the impulse to turn away, turn away, tearing my heart out from a longed-for place of peace and rest. I pressed my hands together, bowed again, taming the monkey of mine. 
And then a sound reached me in the deepest of inward moments, a stir behind me, as to awaken and bring me back, lest I might have slipped over, gone forever, lest, oh, so gratefully, but alas, not yet. Soon Wukong gently, slowly stepped toward the door, and I knew I had to follow. Broke away my gaze, but not my soul, taking the experience with me, memory now, all things passing, impermanent in this world of drops. Outside on the walkway, Wukong looked at me, said nothing, but held out his arm toward me. <clears throat> Swallowing hard, <coughs> Swallowing hard, I knew it was time to leave. Moving on, move on. I hesitating, I told Wukong, it was here that the minder said to me, cutting contempt in his voice, scowling, face contorted. Some of the Japanese tourists actually worship in these caves. I know, said Wukong kindly offering his sustaining arm. I grasped it firmly as I never had before, needing his strength and protection, my guide upon my way, mounted the wind, cloud soaring beyond tricks, carried us aloft, away from that blessed cave. Let me say in closing, uh, trying to give some sense of the, the rest of the book, the whole book, the Parliament of Poets sends the persona back and forth to the moon four times, twice as many times as any astronaut. On Earth, he also visits Angkor Wat in Cambodia, in India, the Kuru field of the Bhagavad Gita, the ashram of Vyasa, the uh, great Indian epic poet, uh, uh, author of the Mahabharata, greatest masterpiece of Indian literature. Journeys with Hanuman, the Indian monkey king from the Ramayana classic. Also in China, the persona visits the ancient town capital Chang'an, meeting the Confucian poet Du Fu, and then the poet Bai Jui, a Taoist master, who eventually takes him to Japan where he meets the poets Basho and Saigyo, other travels include South America, Africa, Sufi poets, Chartres Cathedral, England, Tolstoy in Russia, this is a traveling, traveling poet, ending in book 12, Back on the Moon, with a vision of Earthrise, that rose-like symbol of our time seen floating through the darkness of the starry universe. You could have some time for questions and answers if you like. Somebody had asked, and uh, I'm open to it if you like. Uh, let me say first, it's been a, a real pleasure to read for you from my epic, The Parliament of Poets. It's available worldwide, hardcover and ebook, Kindle, Apple format, EPUB, uh, from Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Kobo, Google Play, and their global affiliates. Uh, just check your favorite online bookseller for the Parliament of Poets, epic poem. I also have some copies at the table on the back if you'd like. I'd be happy to sign one for you. And uh, there's wine and cheese. I invite you to uh, uh, stay and enjoy some if you'd like. And uh, thank you for coming tonight and contributing to the, uh, to, uh, the auction. Friend is, is your is your high faith expressed in this uh, epic poem? Well, uh, that's part of the strand of my life. I consider myself a member of the Reform Baha'i Faith. There are really many denominations of Baha'i, and uh, I, you know, I have a long and you know, complex and spiritual past sort of there too. Beyond that, and uh, I've studied all the religions. I've taught religions. I had academic education in, in the Bible, biblical studies, old and new, and so forth, and everything else. So it's at a point, it's like, well, what are you? Well, 
And and that's why I feel so comfortable with you. you. <laughs> and uh, I, you know, I mentioned uh, uh, Elaine Morris. I talked to her about well, is there's room. There's, there's people who are atheists, or people who are Buddhists, or people. Who, and uh, is there room for me? Because <laughs> I'm sort of this too. And, and uh, but I'm sort of like modern too and beyond all those. To me, I think of it all that fighting stuff over who's got the exclusive truth. I mean, and I, and I try to work with that in the poem, that exclusivism, the exclusive truth of the past, those are so much the problem yeah. for our human experience. And when, to my mind, when we look at the global religious experience, we, as many scholars and other thoughtful people, students have said, in the Western world, you get all those animosities about exclusivism. Judeo, Christian, and Islamic are all grounded in that thinking that there's, there's only one truth, and you've got to convert or kill other people into accepting it. Where in all of the Eastern religions, China comes to mind, China had, uh, the, by the Neo-Confucian period, it, it had what came to be called the Great Church, a blending of Taoism, Confucianism, and Buddhism, and people all thought they were the same. I mean, they, the Chinese book would say, and I, some probably still say today, I belong to the Great Church. And it's not like one or other, and, and India is the same way. It's very much Sanatana Dharma, the universal sort of Dharma of life. And you're not, Hinduism is a word given to Indian religious experience by the British and Westerners and the Muslims it really originated with the Muslims when they first invaded in like 15 or 13, 1200, whenever it was. And um, it's the first origin of, of the word of Hinduism. And then the British picked it up. But to the Indians, historically, they never thought of themselves as having one thing. And there's never been an overarching kind of uh, uh, like uh, uh, you know, Catholicism or the Caliphate. Or is now where there's no power and truth and control. Yeah, there might have been briefly in Andalusia, the Moorish yeah. culture in which uh, it was believed that Jews, Christians, and Muslims are basically the same because they are people of the book, as they refer to them. Yeah. But that didn't last long. <laughs> After a few hundred years, and, it collapsed. And, and they were and still, they were going at times, they were still in dinner. <coughs> they, were, they had to pay a poll tax to the Islamic Right, right. Yes, yes. If you were Muslim, you didn't have to pay attention. So they got a lot of converts. Yeah. <laughs> Are you able to detect a, the effect of these different <coughs> ways of looking at religion? The Eastern, you know, blending of, you know, accepting of mm -hmm. different ways of looking at religion versus the Western, the one true way. Um, in the effect of that on um, the way people live, or how they relate to each other. It's family. modern history. It's all our human history. We know it. You know, it's been all that trauma over trying, I feel, to grow and evolve beyond it. And we, uh, as a Jewish writer Saul Bellow said in the early 60s, were being mixed and poured together. That was back in the 60s, even more so now. I mean, you know, People from everywhere on earth live here and, and elsewhere. So many sites around the, the old isolated cultures are not as, are not, are, they're all gone. They're not the same isolated cultures that there used to be 200 years ago or whatever. We're, we're, we're moving globally to a more human consciousness. And I think the internet even reflects that more. Now, yes, there are all the negative forces working to destroy us. Now, I've had a long, long interest in the United Nations going all the way back to high school, too, and been, been really involved with a lot. And, and, and I, there's a period of my life where I read over 100 books on the United Nations and the League of Nations, so I know that history well, too. And I'm not naive and Pollyanna about any of that, you know, but what else do we have? Other, either we can kill all our, kill ourselves, kill one another. That's all I suggest. What we're going to do? 
And, and there isn't a simple answer because we're human. And so, you know, as a poet, what can I do? Let's go out to the moon and get another perspective on it. <laughs> Look at it this way. What did the ancient poets and the shamans do? They told the story okay? and touch hearts and minds. And that's, that's my hope. That's the poem. But if I could just. Is there a practical wisdom that comes out of, let's say, the Eastern way of thinking that we haven't quite grasped well, ourselves? Here, here's the thing that I try to bring in my epic, too, in terms of Eastern religious experience. It's gone through modernism as well. All right? It's gone through all the problems of modernism. Communism, Marxism destroyed the religion, all of the three uh, strands of the great church in China. The Cultural Revolution, they went out and destroyed 20,000 or more churches, and, I mean temples and churches and everything else. And, and uh, it was officially atheist. It re attempted to tear it out of the Chinese consciousness. And depending upon who you want to read, it achieved that for various levels where the majority, like 89, 90% and more, will say that uh, they are atheists. So all of those ideas of what the mystic East was is no, are no longer true. I lived in Japan for a year and a half, and I knew a lot knew Japan on a personal level. Many Jap Japanese, every walk of life. And Japan history has all gone through that modern experience, too. I've read, uh, I, I taught non-Western literature for, for years and studied in college and elsewhere. And, and in China, Japan, South Asian literature, uh, the story of that literature is like the West, the loss of belief in the old ways. And we take it for granted if, to whatever extent we've read literature, uh, American and English literature, uh, that that's the story. It's this great myth of secularization. But <laughs> where are we with it? And, and uh, uh, so I feel we're moving towards a new vision. I mean, as a poet, I'm trying to create, help create. I, I, I don't uh, um, uh, have delusions of grandeur that I myself alone create this vision. What I believe all epic poets do is they sense what the vision is in life at that time and then moving to what is the dominant vision. Uh, and dominant not necessarily in a negative way. I mean, I mean one that is it's there under the surface or growing or is pervasive and uh, 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 try to serve it. And I think the, I, I would oppose all that kind of thinking that it isn't trying to control people, isn't, man, isn't engineering, it's not social engineering to all the political or religious attempts to do that. We're going to force people into this way. The, the whole revolution under Lenin and everybody else was about forcing people to live, be equal. <laughs> And, and so forth, and you know, it ravaged those societies. They still aren't over it. And we've had our own problems in the West, I think, as many writers and think, thinkers have thought of, thought of it as well. But often, uh, I mean, uh, we have a tendency we want to go to uh, uh, what, the culture wars, how does this serve and fit in? I mean, we've become really divided, extremely fragmented civilization and culture, more than uh, we, we ourselves, I think, even understand and realize sometimes how fragmented we are. And we can't reach agreement on things that then enable us to deal with our problems. And one thing I feel is we need a more global, universal vision of life doesn't mean we all become the same. We're not all become mush and sentimentality, you know. But we have a sense we're all human, and we need to do what's in our best interest. We have these immense problems, and nobody can agree on how to solve them, and they keep getting worse and worse. 
And uh, it may seem unlikely that a poet can help, <laughs> but I'm trying. <laughs> that could be part of the problem, I hope. Frederick, I'm really curious about the format of the story. As I was listening to you read it, I could picture it in paragraph format um, or in a more of a, what might be considered a form of a poem. Is it mostly a matter of your choice that it's written in a poem format? Or is there something about the type of story it is or the way you tell it that lends itself to be considered a poem versus a it's a really a story good question. Of any kind. Really good question. Even fascinating to me to you know to think about because uh, I think uh, it just provokes a lot of good thoughts in me. I I think yes, it's a form. It's in poetry because it reaches deeper into the human psyche than prose. Prose doesn't work. Prose we get into. Uh, we get into the culture wars, we get into all of that argumentation. What epic poetry does is it tries to lift it higher to a different level. Often said at, uh, uh, epic poetry in terms of tone and approach uh, strives for grandeur and elevation and perspective on it. So yeah, it just falls into, it has to be in, in verse. And that verse, for English language, uh, all narrative storytelling tends to be iambic pentameter, also called blank verse, about ten, ten syllables a line, and, uh, and so on. And uh, uh, it's just more dramatic. And inevitably, it lifts it, you know. Uh, Shakespeare will have plays where there's lots of prose going on, and then when in really intense moments come on, he's got to fall into verse to really convey it. I hope. Is that kind of what you're thinking? Mm -hmm. and, and it is paragraphs, verse paragraphs. Okay, And that's a form that's thought of too. John Milton's often thought of as writing in verse paragraphs. Whole ideas or actions taking place in this paragraph. And, you know, I've studied all that. I know I'm doing that too. I consciously do it because you have to divide meaning and action into intelligible holes or you overwhelm people. You've got to give them a break once in a while for the rest of the year, too, and, and whatever. So. Okay? Yeah, speaking of poetry and prose, I refresh my memory. Did Homer did not actually write the stories. Did he tell them, or am I getting that? Well, it was all oral. They weren't written. Okay. They were oral for may, many years, maybe a couple hundred years before they were finally written, written down. Nobody really knows for sure when Homer lived. People argue, was there a Homer? There was a bunch of Homers. It was all put together. Yeah. But yeah. personally, I believe there was a Homer because there's such a, a cohesive consciousness there telling the story. Mm -hmm. And no corporate body of people putting it together are going to have that. That mind had the grasp of all those details and worked them and knew what was in his head. And uh, a bunch of people wouldn't do it. They'd make mistakes here and there. And they don't exist in that poem, those poems. So I agree with people who say that about Homer. But you're quite right. It's oral. And, and really, I... Uh, you know, all epic poetry is trying to do that. It's really about a storytelling and reciting it orally. And uh, I hope I'm, I'm, uh, I'm able to do that to some extent. That's enjoyable. I haven't bored you too much. <laughs> well, you know, no, I'm thinking about yeah. you know, storytelling. And it, it's, you know, using poetry lends itself, I think, to more dramatic um, presentation yeah. of the idea, you know, around the campfire. Yeah. Uh, uh -huh. I'm trying to think of that. Troubadour of the bars. You exactly know, who, it. Who that's, conveyed that's, these these grand ideas yeah. in a rhythmic kind of descriptive way. And uh -huh. So I think that's what Homer is about, actually. Absolutely. Right? Okay. Really Very interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Y
Was that uh, in, in the very beginning? Uh, oh, I get the book and, and read mm -hmm. him, but was it Don Quixote? That, Don that, Quixote is, becomes basically the uh, MC of sorts, uh, Master of Ceremonies on the Moon. Okay. And uh, if you've ever read Don Quixote, Don Quixote himself, uh, himself is reading books about night errantry. He falls asleep in his study and wakes up Don Quixote. He's, re he's really Alonzo Quijanos. Alonzo Quijanos is the, the, the man who becomes Don Quixote in the book. He falls asleep reading in his study and becomes this character. So I'm playing with that myth, too, repeatedly throughout the poem, that the persona himself has fallen asleep over Don Quixote <laughs> that Don Quixote's on the moon. I just got confused because then they brought in Miguel Cervantes. Yeah. And I thought, well, well really I, I play Cervantes. with those names since, uh, loosely. And, and, you know, is Dante the man, the Dante in the book? Is Cervantes the writer, the Don Quixote in the book? So I'm playing with all that appearance and reality. What is real? It's taking place in a dream. Life can seem like a dream. My friend, isn't there a real person behind the persona? We're all waiting to hear who that is. I, you've got to read the book. <laughs> oh, so, <laughs> so. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for coming here.